test, a discussion. So the ups and downs of the straight edge test. Before we get too deep into it, I just wanted to show you some of the results of not flattening a substrate. Kind of interesting little video here. This is when we have a slight bird bath or a dip in the substrate and a floating hardwood floor has been installed over top. Let's go back and try that again. <clears throat> Only takes about a quarter inch in two feet to generate a scene like this and another angry customer. And for glue down flooring, scenes like this, where the resilient flooring just follows every contour left behind by the uh, substrate prep process. Now, I just want you to, again, take another look at this for, from a different perspective. This is a commercial site. There's your 10 foot straight edge, maybe a little, yeah, 10 foot straight edge. And if you get down on the left hand side of this image and follow this blue arrow with your eyesight, you're gonna see the before now and the after later. This is what happens when you install flooring over this scenario. So we're looking along that blue arrow. We're seeing at the front of the straight edge, a three quarter inch gap. And in the middle, a high point, and at the back, a three eighths gap. So a roll in the floor. If I place my right foot here, and then I step in a normal gait or a normal walking fashion along this straight 10 foot straight edge, I'm gonna place my left foot at the two foot mark. My right foot is gonna land on the high spot. And now my right foot in one step has raised up three quarters of an inch. This is why we're concerned about this in the world of flooring. That is a trip hazard. It's a visual issue. It's a rolling load issue. There's all sorts of things. We're gonna uh, dig deeper into this as we go through the presentation. We only have 30 minutes. There's no way we're gonna cover it all in 30 minutes, but um, we're gonna record the session so that if anybody has to jump off, you can come back and, and listen in full to what we say. So if we do go over, um, um, apologies, but you know, it's, uh, it's gonna be good content, I think. Manufacturers, when you, every manufacturer, um, well, I shouldn't say every, but most manufacturers, certainly of LVT products will state if you look here, this is a, a cut out portion of a manufacturer's installation guidelines. Under the, the red line is identifying where it says flat within three sixteenths in a 10 foot radius. So what does that mean? So today we're gonna to go through what is a straight edge test trying to achieve? Keith Robinson from Dialogue is gonna to speak to that in a minute. Um, what are the tolerances and why? Performing a straight edge test, that'll be interesting. And the solution is in the architectural specs. And then we're gonna look at some definitions. Um, what one word means to a subtrade may mean a different thing to an architect or a builder. So it's very important that we all get on the same page with language used to describe this test. So Keith, over to you. Oh, thanks, Chris. No, this is, <laughs> I, 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 we were just joking just before the show. Um, I'm a rower and everything about rowing is about smooth, flat water. It's why I have so many concerns about uh, straight edge and ripples on the floor, I guess. Um, but yeah, so Chris, if you want to just roll on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that uh, the straight edge test looks to do is to coordinate division three and division nine work um, and recognize the work of each trade in, in finishing, uh, in, one, finishing the concrete and then two, installing floor coverings. Um, Next point, um, the architect, the engineer, and interior designer have been addressing the problem, basically trying to overcome you know, uh, uh, floor geometry issues by tightening up concrete tolerances, making them more restrictive. This is causing more problems than it actually solves, which is, sounds contradictory. Um, and we'll come back to the reasons behind that a little later. Well, essentially um, trying to get the two trades, division three and division nine to dovetail rather Correct. than right and now then, we miss each other by about a half an inch. Yeah, uh, the, by, by up to a half an inch, yeah. Uh, sometimes it's only a matter of two or three millimeters, which, you know, is very easy to overcome, but we, we become so engaged in the, in the argument that we forget about what we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, so the next point, the straight edge test, basically that we're trying to develop is there to try and address the concerns for, for high points in particular with um, uh, resilient flooring products, which affect long-term maintenance. Uh, as Chris mentioned, safety, tripping hazards, uh, premature wearing of the floor. There's a lot of things that come about just because of the concrete. Um, yeah, perfect. 
So what are the tolerances and why? Um, well, there are two different types of tolerances. Concrete, yeah, Chris, the, the next slide is perfect. Is it? Okay. Yeah, so the qualitative tolerance, uh, or quantitative tolerance. Concrete is measured using numbers, and it's a ratio, um, if you just click once, um, that measures the surface geometry along defined lines. And they're very specific defined lines. We know exactly where they are. We can go back and we can measure along the same line six, nine months later. And, and we can actually see how the concrete is changing. Um, but it is an average of the surface. It doesn't actually speak to you about the surface. What it means though is the higher the number, the better or flatter or more level the floor surface actually is. So it's an exact process, but it still only delivers averages. Correct. So it, it, you know, it's interesting that you, it's this very specific way to execute the test, but it's still delivering only averages, not, not you know, I guess from square foot to square foot to square foot, those are the, those are exact measurements. But in general, over 50,000 square feet, you're still dealing with averages as a result. Correct, yeah. So on the next click, actually, um, you know, it, it speaks to exactly that. And, and uh, the, the other limitation, of course, is measured three days after placing the concrete, right? Any later than that, the concrete starts to move as it dries, it, it warps, it curls, it... it uh, Gravity it, takes place. Gravity yeah. Works on all sorts of things. So the, the, the longer you wait to measure the concrete, the less, uh, it, the less likely it will meet tolerance. Um, so we're, we're trying to create a, a, a concrete measurable and that's what this test does. So the next point um, you know, the, is, is, is also the instrumentation. Right now, concrete used to use a straight edge and it was leveled and it was placed almost anywhere on the floor, which basically showed an advantage to the people placing the, the concrete. Um, also, it kind of pointed out that uh, you could successfully pass a straight edge test, but not meet the requirements for floor coverings. Exactly. Yeah. Whoops, sorry. I think I might've just messed your slides up there. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that was it. That's good. Uh, so um, yeah, so then we get into the floor covering uh, 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 straight edge, which is more qualitative. It's, it's more about visualizing the result. And I've got a good uh, friend down in New Hampshire that always buys the, the coolest toys. And, and what he showed me what they're trying to achieve uh, with the straight edge by actually using a, a, a laser surveyor. So the next picture, Chris, um, demonstrates a, a laser map. <clears throat> and, and here you can see, you know, where he's looking at the profile using his laser and you can see where he's hand sketched on over the top, you know, I got to take an eighth of an inch off here, I got to take a sixteenth of an inch off, off of here and got to fill in a little bit in the middle. Um, so he can actually tell, tell exactly what the profile of the floor is. And this is exactly what the straight edge test is trying to achieve. So the next click. Um, so what we're looking here is, and it speaks to the differences, is the we're in the flooring industry using an unleveled straight edge placed randomly across the floor. And you'll actually see a demonstration of this uh, later in the show, but immediately before installing the floor coverings. Um, and the next click. So straight edge also allows for visual identification, which can be recorded by, by photographs. Um, and also identify as, again, as Chris pointed out, those gaps that are greater than eight to 10 millimeters within a 600 millimeter differential that are potential tripping hazards, particularly in, in those situations where we have schools, long-term care, uh, operating theaters. Um, yeah. Corridors, yeah. Corridors, all, all those places that, that tend to be troublesome. And yeah, so then if, if we actually look at the way the measurements are made, um, so on the, on the quantitative side of things, um, we're looking at the profile of the floor. So we could like, as a specifier, I'll specify an FF20, FF15, which is, you know, a reasonably good, uh, floor surface. And what I'll try to do is limit the gap measurement to five millimeters. The next click will show you why, um, you know, uh, these are all FF20, by the way, people think FF20 is the, the cat's meow, but here you can see that. Uh, the, the, what the law of averages does, right? So an FF20 with a three millimeter gap, um, it meets a lot of uh, uh, flooring manufacturers minimum or maximum requirement for gap measurement. 
Um, but the thing in this particular example are the, the waves, right? Four depressions along that measurement line, which, which when you see it on, on, on the project site, looks exactly what it looks like in this picture, a series of you know, surf waves coming into a beach. The finished floor will look like English Bay on a wavy day. <clears throat> on a wavy day, that yeah, surface, exactly. That surface that you do not want to go rowing on, Keith, right? Oh, absolutely. That would be that would be wet side uh, wet side up and dry side down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so the next click, this is an eight millimeter gap again, which could be acceptable for some flooring materials like uh, carpets and such, um, but would actually mean that we'd have to knock three millimeters off the the the, the high points <clears throat> in order to bring it into tolerance for many of the uh, resilient and rigid um, uh, floor covering materials. Um, you know, the, the perfect gap, which would be the next click, um, five millimeters, which you'll find is, is fairly uh, common for broadloom carpet and medium set uh, uh, tiles, um, could work. But again, that represents probably only about 20 or 25 percent of the flooring uh, finishing options that you might encounter. And a flooring installer will still find problems, quite rightly so, by dropping a straight edge on this scenario. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is just dealing with the concrete tolerance, so that quantitative tolerance. So, um, so I'm just going to stop you there. Let's just let's just um, quantitative versus qualitative. Just speak to that because we we hear quantitative in reference uh, when we're referencing FFFL measurement, and we hear qualitative when we talk about the straight edge. Why is that? Ah, the quantitative is is numbers. It's repeatable. It's um, you know it can be defined very easily within a standard. In fact, ASTM. E1155 describes exactly what it is you're measuring and how you achieve those, uh, those ratio numbers that give you the 20, the 25, 35 in, in the FF or FL categories. Qualitative is, is more about the installation condition, the things that a person experiences. Um, it's, it's not as easy to, to measure using, using a standard approach Although there are procedures that are highly repeatable, um, but by the same token, completely random in that sense that, and, and again, you'll see why that's random. It's not that it's unpredictable. It's just that it's a, it, it's a constantly moving straight edge versus something which is placed along defined lines. And always compared to a previously installed flooring or previously acceptable flooring installation, uh, which is actually defined by another ASTM uh, F710, which is all about floor preparation for resilient floors. And F710 calls for three sixteenths over 10 feet. Correct, five millimeters. <clears throat> Thank you, very good. So yeah, so here I'm just trying to make a kind of a, a rough correlation. By, by no means does this mean that the, the two measurements are equal. But when we're talking about a three millimeter in three meter uh, depression, when you're looking at qualitative tolerance, you're talking about three meters, one depression of three millimeters underneath that, that uh, 10 foot straight edge, which is more similar to an FF50 FL35. Um, keeping in mind, and if you just click onto the next slide, um, and this is an example of an FF35, which is considered by the concrete finishing trades as achievable using conventional concrete placing finishing and methods. Um, mm -hmm. Anything greater than FF35 uh, requires laser screeds and other kinds of highway screeds, special equipment, um, and a lot more work and, and a different concrete mix to make it achievable. Um, and at that, it would be achievable for a slab on grade, but totally for, for concrete finish, for suspended slabs, unachievable. Um, and in fact, there's no FL for suspended slabs at all. So again, this kind of speaks to, you know, why FFFL measurements are not suitable for floor coverings. Unachievable without um, hydraulic cement underlayment or topping. Or toppings of some kind, yeah, which means that we have to design for more load on the floors, that we, exactly. there's another component of work that the general contractor has to schedule and bring into, into, the, into, the, into, into the project. This is not something you want to try and plan to overcome during late stage, it's got to start from the beginning. No, and, and concrete changes. The, the day the concrete is measured, between the time that it's measured and the time that the floor covering is put down, 
this concrete profile can change 50, 60, maybe even 70%, making the FF50 more like the FF20. And you yes. spent an awful lot of money to achieve a tolerance that will not be met yeah. when the floor coverings are being installed. Keith, <clears throat> I think this is the point where we hand over to Seth, who's gonna look at um, performing the straight edge. And what, what do we expect an installer to do with that, um, that tool on site? Um, Seth, over to you. <clears throat> Should I run this video first, maybe? Um, no, look, uh, give me a second, if you don't mind, Chris. Uh, but thank you, and thank you, Keith. Um, you know, one of the things that Chris had said is your flooring manufacturers very commonly um, state a specification with regard to flatness in a 10 foot span, you know, three sixteenths and 10, maybe it's an eighth and 10, uh, whether it's resilient, wood flooring, other floor coverings. And, and then Keith also mentioned ASTM F710, uh, which is the standard for preparing concrete to receive resilient flooring. And they specify a, a maximum deviation, three sixteenths and 10. So when we're looking at this straight edge, um, we're, you know, the thought is we, we get a 10 foot straight edge and then we're going to, you know, quantify uh, that. And, and this is this was a struggle, uh, struggle for me, because uh, when I first wrap my head around the straight edge is I'm thinking, all right, we're going to quantify things because we're going to put a straight edge down. We're going to measure deviations. We have a value. And when you know, I really started getting into this with the team here. It's like, no, we're not really qualifying with this. We are, I'm sorry, we're not really quantifying with this. We are qualifying this. And it's more of a survey as opposed to a test. And the thing that I want you guys to understand is we're not using this 10 foot straight edge on the floor to conduct a, to conduct a test to, to see whether, you know, the floor passes or fails. Um, what we're doing, we're, we're gonna use this straight edge to basically qualify the floor and identify trouble areas whether it's a hump in the floor or whether it's a bird bath in the floor. You know, that's the idea behind this. So I know, I know we have the word test and everybody may think test, but I think qualifying and the word survey is, is a better description of, of what we're doing. So um, having said that, let's go, go ahead and run the video, Chris. I'm gonna have you play it the whole way through and then I may come back and play it for a little bit and have it stop if you don't mind. So you can see that uh, basically we're sliding it back and forth uh, across the floor. Uh, you can see here that they've, um, the person operating the straight edge has uh, identified a fulcrum or a hump on the floor. You know, you can see it there again. He's putting some marks on the floor to identify that. And basically sliding that straight edge back and forth uh, across the floor to see what we're seeing, um, you know, with that straight edge. Uh, in this specific video, uh, you're actually, you know, finding a, a, a hump in the floor, uh, if you will. You can see that straight edge teeter tottering back and forth, and basically marking out that floor so we know what we're dealing with there. Uh, Chris, I thought I, in, in the video that we had there was a lot of background noise, so I appreciate you, you know, killing the background noise, and that gave me an opportunity to speak while while the video was running. Um, the point being in this situation, we've, we've identified a hump in the floor that we know now we're going to have to have to address. Um, when, when we're looking at operating this test, you know, one of the easiest things to do uh, and probably the most logical will be to grid the floor um, so that you got to grid it out into areas that you can operate the test. And you want to make sure that the floor is cleared of, of everything and, and clean. So you can easily slide the straight edge back and forth across the floor. And, and as you saw in the video there, you know, you're going to detail where you may see a low area or a high area. In this situation of this video, we saw a high area. The critical thing here is if we grid this out is we don't want to simply just work in grids. We want to make sure that we then, uh, after we work in one grid and then work in an adjoining grid, that we also overlap one grid to the other. Uh, so that we can get a true idea uh, of any trouble areas uh, on the floor. You can obviously take pictures, take video, and, and, and make notes of what you have. So let's go to the next slide, Chris. Um, here's a picture of a finished installation that uh, obviously this test wasn't conducted. Um, right in the middle of uh, 
you know, the picture there, you can easily with the reflection of the outside light, see the hump that's in the middle of the floor. Um, that could be uh, detrimental uh, from a, a wear standpoint. It's the high point in the floor. The floor covering is, is followed the contour there and you could wear the surface out. Um, and if it's a, if it's enough of a, a step up, it, uh, you know, possibly could, uh, you know, turn into a tripping hazard as well. Yeah, I would also add into that, Seth, that in a senior's uh, residential situation, that a lot of times because of poor eyesight or, or cognitive issues, that visual line can actually be a barrier to many, uh, many uh, 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 residents. Yep. No, excellent point, Chris. And it's something that could have been easily identified by sliding a straight edge back and forth across that floor in a matter of minutes. You'd, you'd have been able to detail that high point. All right, so we got some graphics here um, that are kind of similar to what we just saw uh, in the video in the picture. You have a 10 foot straight edge here. You can easily see the fulcrum or the high point in the middle. And you may look at this right now and see about 80 to 90% of that straight edge in contact with the surface. Um, but it's, it's obviously raised as it goes over the fulcrum. Uh, you go to the next, pick, next slide. And if you slide that straight edge to the left, as you see, you know, we have the straight edge, you know, in contact and one may think that, okay, we, we don't have an issue here. We, we, we've quote met the spe specification, but we, we can't just look at this as, you know, individual areas. Um, go to the next one, Chris, you know, if you slide that straight edge forward and now you're on top of that fulcrum or on top of that high point, um, it's able to rock back and forth. And, uh, yes, you can measure this and see what the deviation is, but the idea behind it is to identify the trouble area, troubled area of the floor. And this is certainly a troubled area that's going to need uh, you either have to level on the left and right of it, or you grind the middle so that it's flat. Um, another example of a site condition here, 10 foot straight edge. You got a majority of that straight edge in contact with the with the concrete. Um, maybe the last two feet, it's starting to lift up off that concrete surface. Could be a high spot there. Um, we wouldn't know until we slide the straight edge. Um, it also could mean that uh, that concrete is starting to fall away or slope to some degree. Would be able to identify that further by you know sliding back and forth. The key point to note here is. Uh, at the very edge here, we got the straight edge off the floor. It's uh, a quarter inch gap, which is you know out of the the maximum of of your typical specification, and means we need to uh, not only address the area but slide the straight edge around a little bit further to see um, how how much of a troubled area we have. Unfortunately, this is a completed installation that uh, shows something that's very similar. Majority of that straight edge is in contact, but the last couple of feet we're seeing a drop off and could pose some more uh, problems as we discussed uh, that I mentioned and Keith mentioned in some previous slides. Now, conversely, you know, we've talked about high spots, but conversely, you could also have uh, a low area or uh, what we call, uh, you know, in the States, a bird bath, uh, basically a low area, you know, in the concrete and that straight edge is able to identify it. So one, once you do identify it, you can see uh, what that deviation might be with a, a ruler um, uh, to, to uh, measure, measure that uh, gap underneath it. Um, looking at that, that's at least a quarter inch under that gap. And that, that tells me that we have to address that area. So you mark that area and then you'll take the straight edge maybe to 90. No, oh, sorry, I forgot about this slide here. So yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've identified the low area here. And uh, you can certainly see that we take the tape measure to try to see at what dimension the, the low area starts and stops. And if you hit the next one here, you can see that we got a quarter inch deviation and that might span uh, over a four foot period, something like that. And what I would do, you know, as a next step here is, is rotate that straight edge at a 90 degree angle from where it is now and continue to slide it back and forth to try to identify you know, the starting and the stopping points of that low area. And then ultimately, um, you know, you'd use a patching material uh, or leveling material to fill the low area in. Concrete slab that does not look so good. And the one thing that I want to point out here, um, you know, we, we all a sign have of exasperation, Seth. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> uh, my goodness. Um, 
that 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 that's a bad uh, you know a bad slab certainly, and I think we can all look at that uh, that picture and know that there is floor prep that needs to be done before we put flooring uh, down. But but the interesting thing here, and I want some, and this is something that not just for this picture, but that I, but for different scenarios as well. Is I I want everybody to keep in mind um, that that this is not a test to the point where we're trying to use the straight edge to confirm whether we pass or fail uh, something. We, we certainly see all these deviations in the floor, and we know that when we glue down some sort of resilient or other floor covering, we're going to see that through the flooring. Yet it's very possible if I put a 10 foot straight edge down there, you know, we may see deviations, you know, multiple deviations that are maybe even less than an eighth of an inch for that matter. Okay, but the reality is, you know, as Keith, Keith said there, um, you know, you, had, you have some situations where you have multiple rolls in that 10 foot span. And it's not acceptable uh, for the, the performance, uh, you know, the finished flooring. And the, yeah, the quantitative on this line would be probably like an FF5, just to let you know. <laughs> yeah. This is where, yeah. Okay, so this is where both measurement systems, the straight edge and the FFFL work together and say, yeah, uh -uh, stop, we need something to go over top. Yeah, and the other thing is, is just good, good common sense with all of us in situations like that, we can look at this and know that uh, in other situations too, that regardless of what either test shows us, you know, this needs to be addressed, you know, prior to putting flooring down. So just good work practices. Um, this is a floor that's been leveled and um, you know, flattened and smoothed with a, with a leveling compound. And uh, interestingly enough, 12,000 square foot, um, straight edge uh, test run after the fact just to see where we were and you got less than basically a, a consistent 16th inch gap over that entire area you're well below the the, the typical specification uh, for the installation of uh, finished flooring so you can certainly achieve uh, some very flat uh, smooth surfaces uh, with the right materials out there the leveling compounds out there on the market and importantly, placed months after the FFFL measurements were delivered after three days. So, you, you know, you confirm the concrete guys have done their job. They've, they've poured it flat to spec. And then months later, you start thinking about your topping and you, and you end up with a result like this. Absolutely. And then finally, you know, the, 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 the point here of conducting the test, as I said before, you know, we're doing this to find troubled areas. And once we identify these trouble areas, use the appropriate patching or leveling compounds, the end result, you know, is a flat, smooth surface where the floor covering can perform as expected. You know, simple as that. Great. Thank you, Seth. I'm going to hand the baton back to Keith. Yeah, the um, spec solves everything. Uh, the buck stops here as it was. <laughs> you are the design authority, sir. Yes. So uh, just to click forwards, the, the solution is in the spec. And quite frankly, NFCA um, has written, and it's available on the job site, uh, an excellent Division One specification that actually coordinates uh, Division Three and Division Nine by, by describing how people get together, who's on site for all the meetings. And it's not just the concrete people. It's just not the floor covering people. And it's a meeting that happens before any work even starts on the project. So um, it's, it's bordering on telling contractors what to do, but it really does describe what is required to establish a quality control program on the project. Um, and that being uh, the next slide, which is to create tolerance compatibility. Um, as I said earlier, we, we specifiers, interior designers, architects, engineers have been creating tighter concrete tolerances um, that actually change more as, as a consequence where, uh, throughout the project life. Um, and, and it leads to conflicts on the work site because you know, we thought we had perfection. We drew the straight line and now it's no longer straight. Um, the other thing is, is base those tolerances on best practice guidance from both concrete finishers and floor covering installers. Work with those industry best practices and don't set the trades up against each other. Um, there's an awful lot of really unhappy people out there right now, and, and it's largely because uh, there's the finger pointing. Who's responsible? I'll come back to that. 
Um, understand the language, and, and, and I'm going to finish off on that, but the language of design is very different than the language used by the trades. It's really up to the design community to learn what the trades use in describing their work and apply that uh, to the specification. Uh, next slide, Chris. There we go. Um, I talk about creating accountability. This is, this is not to make somebody responsible, but as much as it is, let's test, let's confirm, let's validate the surface geometry throughout construction. Let's map those changes very quickly, Chris. Uh, what you see there is, is a, a Pharos uh, laser uh, uh, device that actually creates a heat map of, of the entire floor. But within that heat map are areas where you, you can see the concrete is, is not placed evenly across the entire surface. That does not mean that these surfaces are incompatible. What it means is that within the grid, as, as Seth was pointing out, within the grid, there are areas that we can then pay attention to where we, we can knock off some high points or fill in some low points. Um, and correct, the word is correct surface geometry. And, and it's not the responsibility, by the way, the concrete finisher, and it's not the responsibility of the floor covering people. In my mind, there are two types of flatness and according to trade scope of work. Um, flatness that is beyond 3 sixteenths of an inch, which is by others. Um, the flooring trade can be contracted in to do that work if they so choose, if they're tooled up to do it. And then there is um, flatness that is tighter than or less than 3 sixteenths of an inch, which is the flooring trades scope of work. Scope. Correct. Simply yeah, and you used the right word there. You know, Chris, I opened a company uh, decades ago called the Buy Others Contracting Company. I've never been called yet to do that work. <laughs> Buy Others work. You're not included in the others. No, sorry. Um, but it's a good idea. It could be a side um, job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so, uh, and, and exactly as Chris said, you know, it's, it's the, the gross correction, those, those corrections greater than 3 sixteenths of an inch, five millimeters, um, that occur between the time when concrete has finished their work and that are required to make the floors uh, acceptable to the flooring uh, manufacturer's requirements. Um, yeah. Next slide. Um, That's an interesting really, point. It's, it's the manufacturer that is calling for these tight tolerances, not the flooring installer. They have to do, they have to abide by the, the manufacturer's um, guidelines. But oh yeah, and, and the very practical guidelines, like if you ever try to put a square uh, tile over a balloon, you'll know exactly why those tolerances are there. There's no way you're gonna chat for each and every single joint in a, in a, in a square pattern tile uh, to fit over all the humps and bumps. Uh, in fact, it just makes the, uh, the whole geometry of the floor go even more wonky than it would be otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. So the big thing for specifiers, and I'm hoping this is a, an aha moment. We need to specify corrections to surface profile. Corrections are an aspect of concrete finishing, and the and the the, the, the trades are trained in this, but they're just not I, not specified. Um, they're largely overlooked. They're usually not addressed until something goes very wrong on the job site. Um, Corrections are required and should be specified. And believe it or not, if you catch them and you account for them, they do not add significant cost to the project, especially when considering the cost that result when work is not identified and problems are encountered on, on the day that the floor coverings are scheduled to be installed. So if we specify that these things are required, we can include them as a cash allowance, we can, uh, you know, for adjustment of contract, or you know, we can we can talk about the consequences of rejection and transference of cost. Um, in fact, I was talking to a couple of contractor friends yesterday. We were discussing trade definitions, and I, I mentioned this to them, and they said, "Yeah, you know, Keith, on, on most projects, we're probably accounting for three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. These big projects for corrections to floors, and they they call it corrections because they know it's got to be addressed, but not everybody does it." Um, I'm actually working with a different organization right now, uh, Concrete Canada, to, to find better ways to specify this. So that's something to look forward to in the future. The other big thing in here is surface profile, concrete surface profile. Um, the International Concrete Restoration Institute defines the texture of the floor. Texture is important. 
we oftentimes over specify, sorry, I'm laughing because I'm one of them, over specify the, the finishing requirements for the floor to have this nice, hard, polished, troweled finish. And we've now made it almost impossible to stick the flooring material to the, that surface unless you're using the special glues that Brent was talking about this morning. And the other thing that we never specify or follow up on is relative humidity within the building, provide actual temporary heat and ventilation, um, uh, indirect heat, I should say, and ventilation well in advance of floor covering to get rid of any of the moisture in the building and actually help to reduce all the, the presence of the alkali salts and things like that, which also interfere with adhesion of materials to the surfaces. Um, again, contract will provide it if we specify it and account for it in, in the project costs. So that's that's my words. Quick question on <clears throat> backing you up a little bit here, but when the you mentioned that the base slab or the parent slab could be poured, planned and poured and finished to meet these three sixteenth one eighth tolerances, if you a certain FF tolerances, if you will, um, versus not planning a particularly tight or a flat surface and then but but absolutely planning a topping to produce mm. that for you. Is this, I don't know how, whether you can answer this, but the cost differential between going one way or the other, is it you know, pretty much the same thing? By the time you build all that extra rebar in and you go for a higher L, uh, an L ratio, you know, if you go from L360 to L960, if you've spoken about that before, how much cost are you adding versus just saying, pour it to half an inch, be done with it, and we'll top it in four months? That's funny, we used to do it that way. Uh, I'm gonna say when I started my job, like 40 years ago, pour to the nearest half inch and, and dump on a bunch of concrete topping was the standard way to make floors. So um, it's amazing how much uh, changes over the decades. But yeah, so really it's, it's not so much about the cost materials, it's more about the scheduling for the project um, because you have to account for the time it takes to cure concrete and then cure the, the toppings how long you're restricting traffic from going over the floor, which have larger cost impacts than just the materials. Um, we can specify that FF35, FF50 for slabs on grade, and we can hold those tolerances when we uh, enforce a good curing plan, wet curing, you know, um, maintaining the curing, maintaining the temperature in slab, not letting it freeze, not letting it get rained on, not letting it snowed on, the, you know, the ground that we're pouring the concrete on, a lot of issues that are difficult to control, but can be, but ultimately cost a lot more than putting a topping on. Do you think um, they're comparable? The cost I think they're very comparable. Yeah, it, you're really trading off one to the other. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Great information, Keith, thank you. Um, Graham, over to you, sir. Yeah, one of the things, one of the challenges for this committee when we sat down to write some sort of a standard on how to take this flatness survey was we realized we weren't all speaking the same language in the sense that we were all reading the same requirements from the manufacturers, the same instructions, but our interpretations, depending on our background and point of view, we didn't define things the same way. And what that translates to, I just think back to my own floor contracting career, you get called in, okay, we're ready for floors, get down here right away and just the understanding of what ready for flooring means. You couldn't see the floor in most cases, and when you could, it was, it, it was a mountain range. Um, and, and that leads to all these contentious situations that- I remember those, uh, a couple of those definitions had us as a group going in, unbeknownst to us as individuals, going in completely the opposite directions with understanding. Exactly. And Chris, if you want to take that to the next slide, we can just share with the audience some of the things, you know, probably everybody in the audience, if you've been in the floor covering industry, you recognize a lot of these terms we see often. Smooth, flat level, almost every set of floor covering instructions includes some variation of those. Um, and then as we were sort of kicking these things around, we realized we did not define these terms the same way at all. And so we've got to try and standardize what these words are actually referring to when it comes to floor covering. So like that, that word smooth. Smooth, first of all, for Keith as the specifier, he was thinking more along the lines of the, the waves on the ocean when he's out paddling, those rollers. Um, whereas if somebody was going to go and install a resilient floor or a floor covering installer, 
it's more of a textural issue for us. If you've got too rough of a surface, those um, inconsistencies, the texture could telegraph through. You'd have a really ugly looking floor that probably wouldn't pass final inspection. Um, and in, in another sense, smooth is not a great descriptor for the surface profile that you need for um, adhesives or for leveling compounds. So for things like that, you want it smooth, but not too smooth, if, if you know what I mean. You need a concrete surface profile. So for a leveling compound, typically a CSP3. For a resilient adhesive, you probably want a CSP2. So we had to kind of get our heads around that sort of definition. So it's referring to texture. And just as an analogy, a skateboard park. Skateboard park is generally considered smooth, but it's not flat or level. Now, you move on to flat and level. Those two terms, in a lot of cases, are interchangeable in common parlance, but they're two very, very different things. Flat is an absence of variation in the surface plane. Uh, no waves, no bumps, things like that. And, you know, for, for most floor covering, there's a, there's a measured amount over that 10-foot span. Like a ramp, for example, a wheelchair ramp can be flat, but not level. And in a lot of cases, floor covering will call for flat, but not level. Some, some floor covering, you actually need level as well, but it's two very distinct terms. They, they're not or shouldn't be interchangeable. Level is an absence of deviation from the horizontal plane. We all know what that looks like. You put your, your spirit level on there, the bubble's right in the middle. It's parallel with the horizon for, for if you want an analogy of it. But that's a very different thing than flat. In most cases, uh, floor covering just needs you to get flat. Typically, level is a lot more expensive of a proposition. Um, one of the other terms that comes up in, in floor covering installation requirements is structurally sound. Uh, how do you define that? A lot of times it comes up, the word deflection gets thrown in there. Now, for someone like Keith, who's a specifier, boy, deflection is something very different from what it means to him than to me. Keith, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the degree that you engineer a structural element, how much it's going to move one lower. Yeah. Yeah. Just like that sag. We're going to build this structure, you're going to pour the concrete, and it'll start to sag, for lack of a better term. Is that... Am I on the right track with that? You're absolutely on the right track. And we, we can design for it. We can establish limits for it. We can stiffen it. That goes back to the L factors that Chris was hinting at. Um, yeah. Structure you sound. Put, it, it, you it, put it, loads it, on it or you pull shoring. You're no, anticipating it, all that movement. It's a calculated engineered amount. Now, from the floor covering installer's point of view, we throw around the term deflection and we've even seen in manufacturers installation instructions no deflection in the subfloor and keith you're going to say well how do you build something with no deflection that's it doesn't make any sense and what we're looking for is to make sure if i'm walking on that floor the china in the china cabinet isn't bouncing meaning the structure of it there's not too great of a span between the joists or too thin of a plywood that when you're walking on it it's moving which will cause wear which will cause issues typically floor covering failures um, so we have to, once again, this is another element where we have to get on the same page so that we're speaking the same language as it were. We've got a note there at the bottom as well about tolerances. And this is another, I think the term aha moment has been brought up a few times in this presentation today. Um, let's say you see something in the install instructions of plus or minus three sixteenths of an inch over, over 10 feet or Something like that. Um, boy, that is not a well-defined, well-understood way to write that. But we've probably all seen it. Um, to me, as a layman, I might read that and go, well, that's approximately 3 sixteenths over 10 feet. I don't need the precise measurement, but that's what my eye, I should be looking for. Anything beyond that, I'll have to make some corrective measures. But in the spec, spec writing world, that's an, what's called a nominal measurement. And that can actually, what, what that means is if this is your reference line, your straight edge, <laughs> plus or minus 3 16 means I can go above that 3 16 of an inch and below it 3 16 of an inch. And I am fully accurate to a, towards a nominal measurement, which means now that, that floor covering or that 
measurement with the straight edge would allow for a three eighths of an inch gap. And that's just far too much. Um, so those tolerances, we need to make sure that we understand what, what it does and what it doesn't mean. I don't think any flooring manufacturer would be happy with three eighths of an inch when they're saying uh, plus minus three. Uh, and, and just to add to the plus or minus on the tolerances, I've even seen people use that plus or minus just to mean approximately. You know, which again is is shorthand and creates confusion. Right. So one of the steps of this committee was to get this collaboration with all parties involved, so that there's not that big fight when the when the installer shows up on site with the toolbox, he's not speaking the same language as the superintendent and the architect and the specifier and all those things. So this collaboration has been really key to um, defining these terms, clear up any misunderstandings, and really providing a better path to creating successful floor installations. Great stuff, Graham. Thank you. Folks, we'll um, open things up to the 